All right, I guess we'll start. And my God, do we have so many things to cover today. Um, because we didn't get to take a look at blocking and non-blocking, obviously it moved to this week. So this week was kind of light. So it's kind of nice that it's not as light, but now it might be a little heavier uh, than I was expecting. So today we're going to take a look at blocking and non-blocking in JavaScript. We like touched on it a little bit in the JavaScript class when we did uh, an asynchronous call out to an API and pulled back the data and then how we actually worked with that data. But I mean, we just briefly like skimmed the surface. Uh, when we're working with Node, because most of the operations we're going to be doing are non-blocking, uh, especially when we're handling things like requests or files, because those are non-blocking, we need to know how to deal with that because this stuff happens asynchronously. And because it's happening asynchronously, it can get a little confusing for people um, because it's not happening in the order that you think it is, right? So we're going to take a look at blocking and non-blocking today. We're going to look at two different solutions to handle blocking or non-blocking code or asynchronous code. We're going to look at callbacks, which you guys are already somewhat familiar with. We're going to look at how we can actually utilize callbacks to deal with asynchronousity. Uh, and we're going to look at promises, which makes callbacks look a little cleaner. They aren't so... It's a little bit more straightforward, a little easier to understand. Uh, I have delayed uh, async and await just because in order to teach you async and await, we need to access a different library. Um, and we're not going to learn MPM modules in the first part of this class. We'll learn it later on. So uh, we'll take a look at async and await when it actually comes to a point where we actually need to use it. Uh, okay, so that's that. Uh, we're also going to take a look at understanding middleware. So we'll be actually using NPM. NPM is a package manager. You already have it. When you installed Node, you actually got a second program available to you called NPM. Package managers are essential for basically, basically allowing you to download stable versions of libraries that people put out as vendors. So we're going to look at NPM a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to create a very simple Node server with a three routes. We're not going to deliver any files, just simple messages. Um, and then we're going to deploy that whole batch to Heroku. Uh, incidentally, we're also going to take a look at Git a little bit because we'll create a branch uh, so that I can show you the scenario that we're going to approach. The, the scenario that I'm thinking is we will have a master branch and then each class will be a part one, part two kind of branch. Uh, when we're done, we'll merge in the master each time. And then that should auto-deploy to Heroku for us, just like Azure does if you've used Azure in that way. Uh, there's also a lab. So I'll be handing out a lab today. Super simple lab. Basically, copy what we did in class today, make some changes, hand it in. That's really all it's going to be. Um, and then there is a quiz, too, which you're in class, so you'll have 10 minutes to complete the quiz. Quiz is super easy, uh, but it will be after this first part that we miss the blocking and non-blocking. All right. Any questions about today's class? There's not a review for last week because last week was a review, <laughs> right? So it was like a review for the JavaScript semester. So there's no review for last week. So um, if you did have difficulty with any of that stuff, uh, please make sure you review notes from before. Uh, you'll notice that in the resource section of Blackboard, I've added some new links in here uh, to kind of help you with that part if you did have difficulty with JavaScript last semester. So there's the JavaScript info site. I really like this site. It's uh, pretty cool. It, it teaches you tutorials on JavaScript, but it doesn't do it in a very hand-holding way. If you want more of a hand-holding way of learning JavaScript, then uh, I would definitely go to W3Schools. This more... This is more under the hood, right? So it will explain a concept, but then it will show you under the hood how that concept works. And I don't know how your particular style of learning is, but my particular style of learning is I do better when I understand exactly intrinsically how something works. Um, so I actually really appreciate this because I can dive deep into a function and see exactly what's happening, what its benchmarks are, that type of thing. So I find this very beneficial. Uh, there's also W3Schools, obviously. Uh, there's the past JavaScript class, which was from last semester, which is going to take a second because we haven't gone to the site. This is one of the things about Heroku, just to note, is that when the server hasn't been touched, uh, it will power itself off after 30 minutes of inactivity. Uh, so you have to wait for the boot up. 
unfortunately. But it's free, right? Who can be free? So this is last semester's uh, version of the JavaScript class. Those of you that were away off to um, co-ops, uh, you haven't seen this, but you uh, have access to the site. You will recognize the content because it is pretty much the same content. Uh, the benefits of this over, say, the other one is that there's actually interactive like these are interactive things that you can actually type right in and get feedback immediately. So that makes it a little handy if you're trying to, you know, recap JavaScript, right? Hopefully you're not on module one of that class because <laughs> that would put you pretty far behind. But um, even if you are like, you know, it doesn't take long to recap. If you need a bit more handholding and you want it a little bit more simpler, then I recommend W3 Schools. Just be... Be very uh, critical of what you're reading because they make mistakes. They're actually notorious for making mistakes. Uh, so they'll tell you a statement that isn't true. So just kind of, you know, add a little bit of, what's the word? Pinch of salt, right? <laughs> Pinch of salt is what they're saying. So just keep that in mind. Uh, also, additionally, there's the command prompt Unix commands cheat sheet there. I posted it. I don't know if it's the best one, but... Come on, Google's Google, right? You want to look up what those cheat sheet commands are, just type in command prompt cheat sheet, right? <laughs> like, and you can find one. Because that's literally what I did and took the first link. So um, there's also the Heroku link, the MLab link, and the GitHub link. Just out of curiosity, has, is there anybody in this class who's never touched GitHub or Git? No? Okay. So that ought to help us get a little bit off to the races. I know some of you haven't had experience working with branches. You basically worked only in the master branch. That's not a problem. I'm going to show you a very simple way to create a branch using GitHub, actually. Uh, and then we will clone it, and then we'll just start from there. And it's not hard. It's actually very quick and very easy to do, quite painless. Uh, we will be using command prompt for doing any GitHub interaction. Uh, you are welcome to use a GUI if you're more comfortable with the GUI, like Git Desktop or Tower if you're on a Mac, or um, I don't know, Git Kraken. What's the other one? Source tree. There's like a whole bunch of them. Um, so just depending on whatever your flavor is that you like to use, I've kind of been forcing myself to get used to command prompt because they were making fun of me at work for it. So <laughs> I started pushing myself to actually use the command prompt to do Git. And I actually find I'm quicker at it than working with uh, Tower, uh, for example. Plus, I find that mistakes happen less when I'm actually not in a friggin' So, anyways, that's it. Uh, any questions about today's agenda, I guess? No? All right. I guess we might as well get at her. Okay. Cool. So, uh, I guess let's uh, boot up an IDE. All right. Whatever your IDE is that you want to work in. Uh, we can play in the same um, directory we were the last time, though I don't really remember where that directory was. Uh... Is it a comp 26 C8 directory? Looks familiar. Yes, there's test.js in there. So just uh, put it into whatever directory it is that you want to work in and pull that open inside your command prompt or your terminal or your PowerShell. Out of curiosity, anybody using fish? The fish shell? Ah, cool. Yeah. Who did? Yes, that sounds about right, yes. <laughs> Connor, that's his like go-to as well as the fish shell. Yeah. Um, yeah, so fish shell, just so you know, it's like this is ZSH, which is like a it's like a wrapper on a shell. The actual shell itself is called iTerm. Um, fish is probably the closest thing to Mac's version of iTerm. Um, Linux has something called uh, Terminator, which is very, very cool. So if you're running uh, Linux, I recommend using Terminator. Um, but Good news on the horizon. I'm not sure if you saw the link I posted about the Windows terminal that's coming, or it might have been already be available. I'm not sure. Uh, that's pretty cool because it's actually a native Linux distro running in the background of it, which means you will have Linux commands on Windows natively without downloading anything else. It'll just come right with your Windows, which is pretty neat. Okay, cool. So from last week, if I want to execute a file, in this directory right now, I have test.js and I want to run it with node. What is my command to run that file with node? Yep, node, test.js, hit enter. And there's all the stuff we were doing last week. It just spits out. Anywhere I had a console log, it just spits it out to std out, right? Which we did last week. 
Now, I can show you a little kind of cool, cute trick. If you're in a directory in terminal, and you want to open this directory in your IDE, now this works in Windows, and it works, or sorry, it works in Mac, and it works in Linux. And it may work in Windows, not 100% sure if it will, uh, but let's give her a go, right? So if you type in the name of your IDE, so if you're using Sublime, it's Subl, S-U-B-L. I'll zoom in a bit so you guys can see a little better. If you're using VS Code, it's code, okay? Then you hit space, and I want to access the directory I'm in. To access the directory I'm in and open that specifically, I press dot. That represents this directory. And then when I hit enter, it yells at me that it can't find the word code. <laughs> I'll show you what Subl does. Ta-da! Subl will open with the directory already open in your IDE, and then you're ready to start. Right? So obviously, if that doesn't work for you, you have to go the long road. Open your IDE, right? so VS Code or Sublime or whatever it is you're playing in. Go to File, Open, navigate to wherever your directory is that you're working in, where that test file is, and then just choose to open it. There you go. <coughs> Cool. So learn how to, oh, right there. Uncheck the show welcome thing. Can't stand that page every time. <clears throat> All right, uh, maybe we'll create a new file just to make our lives a little simpler. So if you right click, uh, there should be a right click to choose to create a new file. Yep, new file, there we go. And call it whatever you want. I'm gonna call it, um, I'm going to call it blockhead.js, just because I can't figure out a good word for non-blocking blocking. So I'll call it blockhead.js. And call it whatever you want, just run that. I'll zoom in a little bit so you guys can see. I will say one of my pet peeves to the, um, to the sidebar here is that as I increase size, it increases size, which there's really no reason for it to increase size. So it's kind of silly. So I'll collapse mine. I'm collapsing mine by using Command KB. Uh, to collapse yours, you can do Control KB, and it will collapse that sidebar for you. That works in Sublime and VS Code. <coughs> cool. So let's talk a little bit about what blocking and non-blocking code is. So blocking is something that you guys have actually worked primarily in. When you code in Java, you're working in blocking environment, unless you guys are doing threading. Has anybody here done threading? Couple of you? Okay, so for the majority of you, no, you have never done threading, so you've worked in blocking code, right? So, unless you're threading, you're working in blocking code. That includes Java, that includes PHP, that includes uh, C Sharp and C++. Uh, the only way to get out of blocking in those languages is to utilize, either build your own event system and work that way, or you're going to work in threads, which is literally taking the threads that are available on your processor and dividing your uh, functionality or operations across multiple threads. JavaScript doesn't quite work that way with asynchronousity. What it does instead is it has something called an event buffer. And what happens is when a operation is executing, it might have multiple states that it can exist in. So for example, um, a request out to like an HTTPS request out. So like basically requesting a website, right? When I request the website, the first piece is the actual request going out that reacts as an event, so that will execute. Then the system is waiting. It's waiting for another event to occur, and that event will be the response. So it can move along and start executing other code until that response comes in. Once the response comes in, it'll be added to the event queue, and then we'll trigger off once it gets reached in the event queue, and now we can actually handle that event. So it gets kind of confusing because these operations are happening at different times throughout your application, and you're not quite expecting you know, when it's going to happen. So often new JavaScript programmers will attempt to, uh, for example, make a request out to the internet, and they'll attempt to save it in a variable, and then they'll try to use that variable later on in their application, and lo and behold, their data isn't there yet. right? And that's all due to the fact that JavaScript won't wait. It will just move on. 
It's not going to wait for the request to complete. It's just going to continue on with its operations and make on with its life, right? So in order to combat that, we have some things called callbacks, which we can use. Callbacks can get kind of messy. We can wind up in something called callback hell, where it's literally just multitudes of callbacks in order to deal with the asynchronousity of JavaScript. Promises are definitely cleaner, and I would say async and await is probably the cleanest way to do it. Uh, but all of these things are doing the same thing. They're all dealing with non-blocking code. Non-blocking code is exactly how it sounds. It's code that does not stop the world. It is not blocking operations from occurring. Two lines can be here, and this line can execute first before this line, which is definitely the opposite to what you've learned with most procedural programming that you guys have actually taken so far. All right? So asynchronous operations, the good news is, is that there are not a ton of non-blocking operations in JavaScript. I mean, we did a whole 14-week course in JavaScript, and we literally only hit asynchronousity in the 12th week, right, when we started dealing with APIs. That's the only time we ever hit it. That's because most of those operations in JavaScript is blocking. Almost like 90% of them are blocking, right? When we actually hit, hit asynchronousity, it's more things like HTTP requests because JavaScript's not going to wait for the response, so it moves on. File requests, same issue. It doesn't know the byte size of the actual file, so it will continue on with its operation while the file is loading in. Uh, there's also two operations, set interval and set timeout. Those are non-blocking as well. So set interval, the idea is that it will basically keep uh, firing off an operation, like a for loop, no different really than your uh, repetitious structure, but it's set to a delay. But it will keep executing that over and over and over again. The cool thing is, is that you can let that run in the background and it can just keep doing its thing, right? And you don't have to worry about it blocking operations throughout the rest of your code. Set timeout, same kind of idea, but it only ever executes once. And then event registered functions. So if you think about event registration, that would be things like uh, click events, right? And mouse, like mouse over, focus, blur, those type of events. Any function that is registered to that becomes non-blocking for obvious reasons, right? Because you don't want this function listening because it would tie up your whole machine, right? You would need a thread for every single listening function, which would be absurd. You'd have to have a pretty powerful processor to be able to deal with that or tons of workers or some other method to be able to deal with that. So asynchronousity allows us to get past that. So those things, we don't have to listen for them. They just wait in the background, and every so often they add to the queue. And then the second a click event happens, it, that event gets added to the queue, and then everything registered to that actual event fires off, right? Cool. So we're going to take a look at an example of blocking and non-blocking code in conjunction with each other. So let's create a little function. We're going to create a function called say hi. It's going to take one, it's going to have one parameter called name and it's going to console log and we're going to use some nice dirty backticks. Hello, dollar sign with the curly braces for our string interpolation. Let's use an exclamation mark name. I love how this thing just like Say hi is defined but never used. Yeah, because I literally just freaking typed it. So, of course, it's not used yet. I have done no other code yet. <laughs> but it's like, hey, hey, over there. <laughs> it's absolute nonsense. So, let's first take a look at blocking code, right? So, I'm going to write a comment. We're going to call this blocking code, right? Each line will happen synchronously. What a terrible, I probably spelled it wrong. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. Yeah, let's, let's, right. let's pretend it's right. Oh, it wanted me to put a period. It didn't like my sentence structure. Yeah. So not only is it going to criticize my coding, it's now going to criticize my grammar. <laughs> All right, so blocking code, very easy to do, no real science here. Literally, say hi, and then give it a name, right? So I'm going to get in the habit of using the backticks as my quote characters from here on in. I like them. 
They're easy. I don't have to worry about apostrophes or escaping anything, right? I can just use them as an actual quote character. So I'm just going to use the back ticks as a quote character. If you're having difficulty finding where your back tick is, does anybody know where the back tick is? Right below the escape key. Just find escape. It's in the top left corner. Literally right below it is your back tick key. Okay? So I'm going to use back ticks. So uh, the first name I have is Caval. So we'll use Caval. Then I'm going to say hi to Devin. Devin. I don't know what that's from. It's ringing a bell. And then I'm going to say hi to Connor. The people in my life. <laughs> now these are blocking, right? So Connor is not going to execute before Devin, right? Because they, they happen in order. It's procedural. They'll happen in order. Our function will register, get set in the memory, and then say hi, Caval will execute first, then Devin will execute next, then Connor will execute third, right? We can actually test that. Go ahead and save it. Open up your terminal. And I'm actually going to see if I can just, yeah, I'll do that. I'm going to throw my terminal over to the side so you can kind of see my code and you can see my terminal at the same time. <coughs> Interestingly enough, VS Code actually has a terminal built into it as well that you can use if you wanted to. So I'm going to type in node blockhead.js, hit enter, and sure enough, just as I said, each one executes in the order that it was typed in. No mystery there, right? Totally what you're used to. Nothing new. So obviously we want to do some non-blocking code, right? So let's uh, let's right here. We're going to do non-blocking code. Each line will happen asynchronously. I mean, asynchronously, it's not nearly as bad as writing asynchronosity or even trying to say asynchronosity. It can get kind of, it sounds like a villain, though, like matrocity or something like that. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to use set interval, which is brand new to you guys. You haven't seen set interval yet. Maybe you have. But set interval, basically the idea of it is it will execute a function each iteration after a set period of time. Okay, it takes, it actually takes an infinite amount of arguments, but it takes two mandatory arguments. The last set of arguments becomes a list of parameters that you want to fire into the function. That's what they're for. So to show you a basic idea of what set interval looks like, the command is set interval, and this thing's going to try to give you some information. Uh, it wants the handler. Handler is just a cute way of saying function, right? So it wants the handler. It wants to know how long it needs to wait before it executes. And one of the drawbacks to set interval that kind of throws off new programmers, it doesn't execute, then wait, then execute. It waits however long you tell it to, and then executes for the first time. Okay? So it will wait the delay before it executes for the first time. So if you need to execute the function before waiting for that delay, then you've got to literally call the function. Then do your set interval and let it call the function after the delay. Okay? So we'll see that. First, we're going to tell it the function we want to execute. And the function we want to execute is say hi. right? And you might remember this. Notice there's no parentheses after this. That's because I'm not passing the execution of the function. I am passing the what? Exactly, the definition of the function. Literally, the syntax that makes up our function is being passed into set interval. And set interval is going to call that after the delay each time. All right? The next piece is how long I want to actually wait for. So, why don't we wait two and a half seconds, give it a long period of time? The second count is always measured in milliseconds, right? It's 100 milliseconds for every second, or sorry, 1,000 milliseconds for every second. So that's two and a half seconds in total. And then the last bit is our arguments that we want to pass in to say hi. Well, say hi only has 
one argument, and that is the name that we want to pass in. So we can literally just type out what the name is going to be. So I'm going to use the name Michael. Now the unfortunate side effect to all of this is it's going to say hi Cabal, hi Devin, hi Connor, and then it's going to say hi Michael, which it would do anyways because this operation is literally happening two and a half seconds later. So, you know, just based on the fact of how fast a computer operates, it's definitely going to happen in the same order. So how can we actually kind of show that that's not the case? Well, first of all, why don't we actually do another set interval and we'll cheat. You know, control shift D or command shift D, right, just duplicate that line. Change out the name to something other than Michael. I'm going to use Goggin Deep. And I'm going to change 2500 to 5000. You know what? That's silly. Why don't we actually make it less than the original number? So let's do 1000. So if we look at this, we're going to go, okay, based on procedural coding, right? It's going to go Caval, Devin, Connor. And procedural coding would say Michael Goggin Deep. It would go in that order, right? But we've got this delay. So, you know what, based on the fact that the delay is going to happen, uh, Gog and Deep will execute first and then Michael will execute first. Very obvious, right? So let's, uh, we're going to do one little piece, one last little piece. It's going to show that this whole thing is asynchronous, that this will execute in an asynchronous fashion. We're going to say, hi to Daryl. And we're going to say hi to Ilya. Again, people in my life. Right. And based on procedural code, we would actually hit this and stop. The whole world would stop, wait 2,500 milliseconds, and then execute Michael. Then we would hit this and stop, right? Wait 1,000 milliseconds and execute Gog and Deep. And then we would execute Daryl and Ilya. But that's not what's going to happen. Just out of curiosity, does anybody know what order these names are going to appear in? Does anybody want to give a guess? Daryl, Ilya, Gog, and Deep, and then Michael. Right, exactly. So it should go Caval, Devin, Connor, Daryl, Ilya, Gog, and Deep, and then Michael. So totally out of sync. And that's because it's asynchronous, right? So it's not going to wait. It's going to just keep moving on. Yeah, Tuna. Get Gog and Deep to execute when? Yeah, before the, uh, without setting set the Oh, before Caval, Devin, or Connor? So, like, if we set this to zero? No, no, no. Uh, I'm saying if you put no, say hi function, uh, just to, uh, So, if we put like 5 million say hi functions in the top part to see if we could delay it just long enough to take more than 1,000 milliseconds to execute? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we can uh, simulate <coughs> this into a little bit of the 1,000. Do you want me to do it? How about we execute this first, and then I'll do exactly what you're suggesting. All right? Hopefully, we don't blow the memory on my machine. But we'll, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Yeah, exactly. We can see. So let's execute this first just to prove that we're right. Sure enough. <laughs> Notice it, it keeps executing, right? Because that's the joys of set interval. It's going to execute forever. It will literally just keep executing until we stop it, right? But as you can see, Cabal, Devin, Connor, Daryl, Ilya, Gog and Deep, Michael, it did it in the order that we said it was going to do it in. Now, you're probably like, okay, cool, Sean. Now how do I stop this stupid thing? Right? <laughs> so it's Control and C. That actually kills the process. I should have just packed up my stuff and left. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> All right. So we can see that this is asynchronous. Let's uh, let's satisfy Tuna's idea here. Let's just do a for loop. Maybe it's totally up to you if you want to test how much memory your computer has. So let i equal zero. If i is less than 1000, 
time. What's that? We can uh, shorten the time. That's true. We can always shorten the time to try to offset it, right? Okay. I'm actually kind of curious on how fast this is going to hammer these out for 10 million, right? So 10 million is basically got to keep it offset here. And the thing is, is you might be like, okay, well, that makes perfect sense. If it's 10 million, I just divide 10 million by 1,000, and that'll tell me how many seconds it's going to take. But your computer doesn't function like that. Your computer isn't a literal millisecond per operation. It's a nanosecond per operation. So it'll do like 100 of these in a block really fast, right? So 10 million might not even be enough might not be quite enough to, uh, to spit these out before this executes itself, right? Yeah. All right, are we ready? I'm gonna clear that. So what do we got? One second, two seconds? We might not even see it actually execute. Should work with a much smaller group, or at least a consistent name. Oh, I, I saw it spit out. Yeah, we're definitely way past the point. But it is executing them. Every so often you can see it spit in. You're probably like, yeah, bullshit. <laughs> I can't see it at all. What are you talking about? <laughs> that, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, so why don't we make that a little simpler then? Because that, that's kind of hard to see. So why don't we just do, we'll just change these to one. So in theory then, we'll see it spit out. It should be a little bit more noticeable, right? And uh, while I'm at it, I'll add a search in. So it should highlight it for us. So the first one should be coming about now. I think you're right, though. I think it literally just ties the system up. For loops are only, no, the for loop should still continue on. It should still wind up executing the set intervals. It won't wait for it to finish the for loop. It shouldn't. I might be wrong. The for loop might be blocking the whole operation. Yeah, that's true, actually. It's never actually defining it. So if it blocks all the way through, then we'll never actually hit center interval until the 10 million are done iterating. Well, then that's, that's a terrible test, isn't it? So obviously, whoops, what is it? Command control to move? Yeah, let's, let's move this guy up here. There we go. So now Gog and Deep should execute every one second because it should be registered now. Like, this is happening stupid quick, too, so I'm not sure if you're even going to see it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just there's so much happening, it just can't get to the event buffer to actually allow the thing to go. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That's fun. <laughs> All right. I'm going to just reverse this back to what we had just so I can post this code later on because I know some people appreciate that. You want me to keep the for loop in there? All right, I'll keep the for loop in there. I mean, for the people that aren't in class today, they're going to be really like, what the hell is this supposed to be doing? <laughs> All right, so incidentally, the way we deal with asynchronicity is with callbacks. And because set interval is technically a callback operation, Right? Um, you can actually see this is where we're passing the callback. Now, what is a callback? A callback, in the simplest of terms, is a function calling another function that has been passed as an argument. Okay? So when you think of arguments, you think of strings, and numbers, and booleans, right? Uh, some of you may have even at some point passed an array as an argument or an object as an argument. But in JavaScript, you can actually pass functions as arguments. And JavaScript isn't limited to that. You can actually pass functions as arguments in many different languages. Just a lot of people don't tend to try, right? 
but you can. You can, and PHP supports callbacks. Uh, C++, like that's a pretty mid-level language. Getting down there kind of low into the gritty code, right? Uh, C++ supports callbacks by using memory addresses. And you can actually use a memory address to locate wherever your function is defined and then call that function. And that's essentially kind of what JavaScript's doing under the scene when you pass it in the memory address of, the, of that particular function, because they're passed by memory. When you pass in that reference to it, uh, and then you pass in the parentheses, those parentheses are the actual operator that executes the function. But when you're just passing the definition, as we are here, you're literally just passing, you're not even passing the word say hi. You're literally just passing name and the block. That's what you're basically doing. So callbacks, we've used them quite a bit. We used them when we were working with arrays <laughs> in for each loops. We've used them when we did filtering and stuff like that. And we also used them when we did API calls. We've used callbacks quite a bit. All right. Simply put, a callback is a function that is passed as an argument to another function to be called at a later time. That's cool because that means that you're not restricted to when you need to call that function. You can literally call it whenever. You, you totally have access to whenever you want to call that and then perform an operation based on uh, some information. And that comes in really handy when we're dealing with things like HTTP requests, right? When we don't know when we're going to get our page back, obviously we want to do something with the response we get back. So we need to be able to pass that into an operation, right, to execute at a later time because everything's happening asynchronously. So let's take a look at a callback function. We're going to create one now. Um, I'm going to create a new file just because it is a little bit more convenient. So I'm going to do a new file. And I'm going to call this, uh, what am I going to call it? I'm going to call it callbacks.js. <laughs> and I'm going to create a super simple callback, very, very simplistic. I'm just going to call it farewell. I mean, we always do greeting, right? So why don't we do one that's a bit different? We'll do farewell, give it a name as an argument. Let's give it a body, just console.log, right? A couple of back ticks. And we'll just say goodbye, dollar sign name. Right, And I mean, I just love being cheeky and copying and pasting. I remember that being a pet peeve when I was in college, that the instructors would never copy and paste. And I'm like, you're really just trying to fill out three hours by making me type every line? Like, I've already copy and pasted the thing you're doing. I'm done. I'm now waiting, right? So yeah, no, I like copying and pasting because it's something you got to get used to. I'm going to call this greeting and literally just change this to hello. There we go. <coughs> but I'm not done. What I want to happen, I want greeting to call a callback function. Now, my function is called farewell, right? And I could, in all theory, I totally could just go farewell name, right? That's totally fine. But what if later on, at some point in my library, I changed my function name from farewell to, oh, do I want to try to spell it? Sayonara? <laughs> That's butchered. <laughs> but say I want to change it to like Sayonara, right? That's not going to work. This is going to blow up. I'm going to get a reference error because these things don't connect anymore, right? There's no connection to these things. So the way to fix that, I can use a callback to fix that. So what I do is I give greeting an extra thing. I give it a I give it an argument called callback, like a parameter called callback, right? I'm going to change this back to farewell. And now callback is just a parameter. I can pass it whatever the heck I want. It doesn't matter what it is, right? String, boolean, whatever I want. But obviously, in order for me to use it the way I want to use it, I want to actually call it like a function. And the only thing that separates function definitions from other types of values is that you can use an operator, an execution operator on them. So I'm going to call callback and execute it. And I know my callback function takes an argument, right? So I'm going to pass it its argument, which will be name. And I'm going to save that up. So 
So now, at some point, if I want, I can modify my callback. I can change what function it is. I can deprecate farewell, create a brand new farewell type function, call it Sayonara, Avita Zane, whatever it is I want to call it. And I can now pass that to my greeting function as a goodbye function, right? So let's, uh, let's utilize this thing. So I call greeting. Greeting takes two arguments now. The first one is my name. And then the second is the function I want to call. And I'm literally just going to pass it a function definition. And look, I have one. It's called farewell. Now, if you want to pass a greeting, you do so at your own peril. <laughs> because if you pass a greeting, what have you created? Recursion. Exactly. You've created recursion. So don't pass a greeting. <laughs> I'm going to pass it farewell. And notice I'm not passing the parentheses. Why am I not passing the parentheses? Yeah, Tina. Yeah, so if I pass the parentheses, what would wind up happening? Do you know? It's going to resolve to what? What value will it resolve to? What's that? Nope. Nope. It'll resolve to undefined. Because it has no return. Farewell has no return. So it'll be undefined. And that's literally what will happen. When you put the parentheses in this, it's order of operations. Just like bed mass. You guys took bed mass in school, right? Order of operations. This farewell function will execute first, return its value into here. Then this thing will execute and try to call that as a callback, which will literally be trying to call it would be as if you were doing this. That's literally what you would be trying to execute, right? Which obviously doesn't exist. We haven't defined it. It would just blow up. So just keep that in mind. You don't want to put parentheses at the end of this because you're passing in the definition. So go ahead and save that. Open up your little note box, right? Here, I'll collapse that so you can see what's going on. Open up your little note box. Obviously, don't execute blockhead again. We'll execute callbacks.js. Hit enter, and sure enough, there's hello, Sean McKinnon. Goodbye, Sean McKinnon, right? This doesn't really show asynchronicity, obviously, right? Because this is all procedural code. This is all blocking code. Nothing in here is non-blocking that I've done. So you don't really get any kind of cool effect out of this. But I would have to say that this is one of the simplest, simplest examples of callbacks, and I would recommend saving this code, right? Because callbacks will definitely be on the, the final and the midterm. So save this because this is the simplest way to understand callbacks. All right. Any questions about callbacks so far? No? OK. Let's add in another piece of callback. And uh, you know what? Let's create another file for this just because you don't want to ruin your very simple callback file. So we're going to create a new file, and I'm going to call it async callbacks, or callback. I don't know why I'm calling it callbacks, not plural. <coughs> so like I said before, JavaScript only has a few asynchronous operations that occur. There's only a few. There's only a handful. And those usually have to do with dealing with files, dealing with requests. Uh, like any type of transfer protocol request, so not just HTTP, but also FTP, SFTP, SCP, whatever transfer protocol you're using. Um, all of those are asynchronous operations. File serving is asynchronous operations. Uh, set interval, set timeout, and events, right? Those are all asynchronous operations that you have to deal with. And some libraries also wrap things in an asynchronous operation. You can actually create your own asynchronous operations if you wanted to. Um, but it becomes difficult. Most times, it's not something that you would do. Uh, there might be occasions where you'd want to. Uh, pub sub is also an asynchronous operation. So because there are these few things that we have to deal with, and when we're building node servers, we're going to be dealing with HTTP requests constantly, right? Because we want to be able to take traffic coming in, requests coming in, and give them a response back in order to produce a website, right? Because that's our goal. Our goal is to have a website and produce some sort of content to our user. 
our user is going to type something in the address. We now need to handle that <coughs> request of whatever it is and return a response. But because these things happen at different timings, we need to be able to do that asynchronously. That also helps us with scalability as well because now we can handle multitudes of requests coming into our server without needing multiple processes to deal with those multiple requests uh, due to asynchronicity. All right, so let's, uh, let's do this. Let's, uh, we're going to write a very, very simple uh, little code block. And the cool thing we have going for us is we're going to use a library that is already available to Node. So we don't need to install anything. Uh, you already installed it when you installed the core library. Uh, the library we're going to use is called HTTPS, and there's also an HTTP version. And those things are different. You might not think they are, but they are. Uh, HTTP is an insecure transfer, meaning that when I make a request and I transmit your response, it is plain text from both translations, right? There's no security between me and the endpoint. Whereas HTTPS is a secure communication from one point to the other. The communication is a handshake tunnel that started from one point to the end, and it's encrypted from both ends, right? So the only person who can decipher what I'm transferring is the endpoint. Nobody else can transfer anything in between. Uh, it used to be that nobody really gave a damn, uh, but then Google turned around and said, put SSL on your site or I'll penalize you and drop you to page five where nobody will find the body. Right? So <laughs> that's basically what's happening. Now everybody has SL. And there's no reason not to because it's not 300 bucks a certificate anymore. Now it's free. So there's really no reason not to have SSL. Okay, so we're going to use SSL. So we're going to use const HTTPS. So what I'm doing here is just defining a variable, right? Just declaring a variable. And it happens to be a constant variable, which means it's never going to change. I'm never going to modify that value, right? So I'm just going to store it in a constant equals, and this is a node-specific function called require. And what it's for is require allows us to basically reach into our file system, access a file, pull it out, and use it. Now, the cool thing about require is it is implied that if we don't use dot slash or any file path, it is implied that we're referencing either the node API, the core API, or our node modules, which we'll look at later on. So the cool thing is, is in order to require the HTTP li uh, HTTPS library, all we have to do is require HTTPS, and it knows where to get that from. We don't need to tell it where to get it from. Yeah. Is it looking first all of it and then? Yeah, so it is, yes, it is uh, priority based. So if you have a module that you've created called HTTPS, it will use that first. If it doesn't find it there, it will check in the node modules folder. If it doesn't find it in the node modules folder, then it will move up into the actual node core library, right? Not something you hit very often. Usually you're pretty clear. You would know if you're overriding it because <laughs> you would be doing it intentionally. So it's not something you're really going to hit, just something to be aware of. Yes, Ali? So is it kind of like include? Very close to include with PHP. Uh, is Java use include? ASP uses include. Yeah, it's very similar to those same ideas. Using, same, idea. same idea. There's also another one too when we get into React, which is import, and it's the same thing. Okay. They're all doing roughly the same thing. <laughs> and we're actually going to build our own little modules too that you guys will be requiring at some point, and it's quite simple on how it works. But there is some kind of, some kind of quirks with it as well that you need to be aware of. Okay, cool. So I have const HTTPS equals require HTTPS. I now have an HTTPS library to work with. This library is cool because it allows me to be able to make HTTP requests out. It has already been built for me. I don't need to understand uh, transfer protocol rules. I don't need to understand you know, how the transfer protocol works and the whole request cycle, life cycle. I don't need to add things into the event buffer. I can literally just be and dumb as anything and just use the damn library, right? So that makes our lives a lot simpler than having to understand all that extra stuff. So we're going to build a cool little function and we're going to do, you know what, we're going to create a variable and we're going to make it equal to an anonymous function. And our anonymous function is going to have that wonderful magic terrifying word called callback. 
Maybe it's not so terrifying anymore, right? Maybe it's starting to get less terrifying. <clears throat> and obviously, if I'm writing get insult, you know those of you who have used the MatBass insult generator with me know where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah, we're going to use Maddie's insult generator, which is super fun. So let's create a URL. Well, we're not creating a URL. We're using a URL. We're just going to assign it to a constant variable. Notice I'm using like primarily constant variables. That's because none of these values are changing. I'm optimizing my efficiency because I'm setting the exact amount of memory I need, right? So const URL equals some dirty back ticks, HTTPS colon slash slash, those are forward slashes, insult, not install, insult dot mat with two T's, bass with one S, dot org slash API slash insult. <clears throat> now, if you're easily offended by insults, then when we execute this, I suggest you just look away. Okay? All right. All we've done is assign a string to a URL variable. We've done no magic yet. There is no magic happening in this scenario. We've created a function. It's no different if we called it function get insult. We're just doing it a little differently to remind you that we can assign anonymous functions to, to uh, variables. We've assigned a string to our URL. Totally cool. Nothing brand new. Let's go ahead and actually utilize this thing. So we're going to utilize the HTTPS library. We're going to start with the HTTPS uh, thing that's up there. That is an object, incidentally enough. And we're going to learn that real fast because we have dot available to us. And look at all these wonderful things that we have available to us when we press dot. Right? All those are methods and properties that are available to you on the HTTPS object. We're only going to use get. There's also posts. There's a whole bunch of other ones. Don't fall in love with this library because we're not going to be using it. We're going to use it for this and then never touch it again. <laughs> we're going to use something called Axios, which is much better. <laughs> All right. Now we just need to pass it two arguments. It takes one argument, which is the URL that we want to connect to. The second argument it takes is either options, which we're not going to give it, or a function. So we're going to give it URL, which is the URL that we defined above, right there, right? We're going to pass it in. <clears throat> and then we're going to give it an anonymous function. So function client, nope, not the P, one of curly braces. <clears throat> Here's what's happening in the background. Get, HTTPS is going to send a request out to that URL. That URL is going to return a response, and we're going to get back what's known as a response client. That's going to get published into this right here. This is one very cool thing about callbacks. The whole idea of a callback is to call the callback, right? I can not only just call the callback, I can also give it an argument. So if you put a placeholder in for me, like a parameter, I can actually put a value inside that parameter for you. And that's exactly what HTTPS is going to do for us. It's going to go get this URL, and while it's waiting for the URL to come back, it's going to generate a client listener and dump it into that value for us. So that's the thing. We don't have a response yet. No response from Matt yet. Hasn't said boo to us. All we've got is a ping. Yes, it exists. That's literally all we know. So what we can do is with the client, we can actually listen on the client for when something is going to happen. And we can trigger an event. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do client dot on. And we're going to listen to the data event. It's going to publish an event called data for us. When it, when it publishes that, I want to execute another callback. Here's callback number two. Function. Function's going to take an argument that the client is going to pass to us. I'm going to just store it in data because it makes the most amount of sense. And now that I'm done, data will actually be the proper response from that. It'll be our insult when we're done. 
So now that I'm done, I want to actually take that insult and pass it out somewhere. I want to move it out somewhere, right? Into another operation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our word callback and I'm going to pass it the data value, but I have to call to string on this data value in order to get the actual map pass insult. And I recommend dissecting this. Once we start using Axios, a lot of this gets removed from you and becomes super, super simple, right? But dissecting this will help you better understand it. Break it and then try to fix it, that kind of operation, right? Which you should be doing with any code you're writing. I think under the hood, Axios uses HTTPS still. Uh, but I think there's a lot of efficiencies in it. It passes proper headers. It takes care of a lot of abstraction that you don't have to deal with, right? Uh, especially dealing with things like cores and stuff like that. Kind of handles all that garbage for you. Axios is pretty good. It's not only just available on Node, it's also available in React. That's why it's a perfect library, because you, you don't need to learn something new for each operation. We're going to use it in Node, we're going to use it in React, and just use it back and forth, right? So, um, Actually, we might not even need Axios in Node, because we're going to be using Express primarily, and I don't think we're doing actually any API calls, so it will probably just be primarily in React where we use it. Okay, so now we can actually call our insult, right? So here's our insult. Now I want to actually call the insult. So I'm going to do get insult. Insult takes a callback, right? See, we, we said we're going to give you a callback. Now in JavaScript, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to actually commit to your promises, right? And totally just say, no, I'm not going to give you anything. That's totally fine. And sometimes JavaScript will blow up and sometimes it won't. It just depends on JavaScript. Uh, in this scenario, it definitely will because it's going to try to execute that. <coughs> and we don't have a definition in there. So we'll wind up trying to execute undefined. So we're going to give it something. We're going to give it function. Just a nice little anonymous function. And when get ex insult executes, notice that this callback is passing in this argument. This is exactly what I was talking about before. This callback is getting this argument. So we need to catch it, right? So we're going to catch it. Let's just call it insult, because that's literally what it's going to be. And we'll just console.log it out. Not instool, insult. And there we go. Nice handy 15 lines. I mean, 15 minus 4, so 11 lines, actually, if you take away the new lines. Wow, I can't do math. 12 lines, sorry. <laughs> what more do you want? All right. Anybody still typing that out? No? Cool. Let's execute it. So open up your instance, right? Remember, it's async, so node async. And you only need to type ASY and hit tab, and it will fill it all out for you. Right? Hit enter. You're as hideous as an infernal, foul, hideous bag of naughty cat droppings, was my insult. Yeah. Anybody else get an insult? Anybody not get an insult? Just Hitesh, the only one. Matt was like, Hitesh, you're too perfect. I can't insult you. That's all you're getting. <laughs> you get a, what did, you, did you get an error, at least? I just got the insult. You just got the insult? OK, so it just took some time. The round robin took a little bit to get back to you. But that's an exact example of how asynchronousity works. You have no idea how long that response is going to take. And it can time out, right? So that's the cool thing about asynchronous is you're not waiting. You don't stop your application. You just continue on. Now, often, when you're making these requests, you want to actually work with that data, right? So the whole idea of moving on isn't necessarily what you want to do. There are very distinct times where you want to actually do asynchronousity. That's why we have things like promises and async await. So just a couple more things before. We're just going to take this wonderful insult generator that we did, and we're just going to convert it into a promise just to make things a little cleaner, a little easier to read. We are not going to reduce our code with it, though, but we are going to make it a little easier to read. Promises provide us two wonderful methods on a function when we wrap them. And that is then, which says, hey, everything was good, or not good, doesn't really matter, but 
the promise is done. You have fulfilled your promise. So now, bleh, here's your response. That's basically what happens. And catch. Catch is explicitly for catching errors. Now, if you use then and catch together, you get this really beautiful Goldilocks zone where any success goes to then and any error goes to catch, which is really nice. It makes your code very readable, right? It's promise to do this, then do this operation with the response, catch any errors or any mess ups, and you're done, right? So promises are very important, and we will be using promises quite a bit with our code because um, when we start working with controllers and requests, we'll need promises in order to deal with interactions with Mongo. So everything else basically stays the same. The HTTPS part stays the same. The get insult callback stays the same. Um, should we put this in another file so you have them nicely separated? Would that make things easier? OK, so then create another file, new file. Call it promises.js. Jump back to your async callback, command A or control A, command C or control C, and paste that into promises so that you have that starting code. If you're in Sublime, you might even be able to right click on the async callbacks and choose duplicate if you have sidebar support. Oh, it doesn't actually fill them out for you. Um, are you using Visual Code? Uh, you might need to install like the Node library. There's like a Node library extension that should give you more snippets. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna close off my sidebar. Okay. After this, we'll take a small break, right? And then when we get back, we'll do a quick quiz. Okay, so everything else stays the same. HTTPS stays the same. The get insult setup stays the same. The URL stays the same. Where it actually changes is right above our HTTPS request. This part here is going to get wrapped. Gentlemen, this part here is going to get wrapped in a fun inside a promise that we can then respond on when we're done. And what that looks like is it's return new promise with a capital P. Promise takes a callback of function and it has two placeholders, resolve and reject, or parameters if you want to call it, and then the set of parentheses. Just write that out as is. Don't attempt to wrap yet. Just write it out in one line for right now. All right. I want to take this nice and slow. Trust me, everything underneath is going to go red for a minute. Anybody still writing that out? Yeah, just give you a few seconds. The idea is that the promise will actually wrap this, and because it's giving us these two parameters, those two parameters are also callbacks. We get a new function called resolve, which is a callback, and we get reject, which is a callback. The cool thing is, is we can call those wherever we want strat strategically within our code. So we can resolve the promise when we want to and we can reject the promise when we want to. Get insult will then get two brand new methods. It will get then and catch. Then we'll wind up receiving the response from resolve and catch will wind up receiving the response from reject. Okay? So we're going to show you how this all works out. So take from line 11 where that semicolon and the curly brace is up to the HTTPS. Make sure those things are in line with each other, right? So you don't want this guy. Just everything from above that. Hit tap so that it moves in. So that it looks like it's nested inside the promise. I love it when I can hear the... <laughs> I know where tab is. <laughs> All right. Okay, at the end of the promise, this curly brace, the closing curly brace, the closing parentheses, and the semicolon, highlight it, hit Command or Control X. Okay? Put your cursor beside this closing curly brace, the parentheses, and this semicolon, and hit Enter so that you're on to the next line. And then Command or Control V to paste in the promise's closing curly brace and parentheses. 
When you're done, the whole thing should be wrapped. This is what it means to wrap something in a promise. So if anybody says, hey, just wrap that in a promise, that's what they're referring to. They literally mean wrap it in a promise. <laughs> All right? Now, nothing has changed. This code will still execute. Everything is fine. The difference now is we have resolve and reject available to us. We can actually do some things with those two wonderful callbacks that make our lives very, very easy. So when the client commits the data and we actually get the data back, that's when we want to resolve, right? We've got the data. We want to do a resolve. So we have one more modification to make. We no longer need callback because we've replaced it with resolve. And we're just going to change the word callback inside our code to resolve. So remove the parameter callback and then change the word callback underneath the client.on block to resolve. The other cool thing is, is if our URL is malformed, we currently have no way to detect that. We just won't get a good response back, right? We can actually commit an error if the URL is malformed, right? Malformed being not a correct URL. So what we can actually do, we can assign our HTTPS response. So we'll do const request equals in front of our HTTPS. So now we're storing whatever information this is giving back. Okay, And then notice where the const is. And notice if you follow the pipeline down, you can see the curly brace, the parentheses, and the semicolon that are obviously a part of that block. Press enter a couple of times so that you now separate it, right? But you're still within the promise. And this is where we're going to do request.on. On is shorthand for basically saying when this event occurs. That's literally what it means. When this event occurs on this object, right? So when an error occurs on the request function, Let's pass it a parameter so it can, has somewhere to put the error. And we're going to reject it. I reject your error. So we resolve when we get the data back correctly, and we reject when we don't get the correct data back. <laughs> we reject if we have a problem or an error. Right. So now, yes, this is a ton of code, but now we can turn this into a much more sensible um, structure that makes a lot more sense because it, it reads better. It just makes more functional sense. So first of all, gut everything inside here so that you basically just have get insult as a function call. So we've committed the function call get insult, right? Put your cursor so you're on the left side of that semicolon and hit enter so the semicolon moves to the next line. We're literally going to take our semicolon for a ride, right? Just for the next couple of steps. We're going to use dot then and dot catch. Now you can tab them in if you want to. That seems to be Prettify. That's what it does. It tabs them in. It doesn't matter. Just as long as you don't have any code or new line characters between these, because essentially what's happening is these are chaining. This is no different, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, this is no different than that, right? What you do in Java, you do in so many different languages. These are just chained together. It's just common practice to put them on their own lines. Then and catch both take callbacks. That's their purpose. So what happens is when the resolution happens, it takes whatever you pass to resolve and passes it to whatever callback is there. When we're done, you are so going to love the fact that we're learning about error functions today. 
All right, so function, I'm going to call this insult, because that's what it is, like so. And now I can do console.log insult. And you can see how this reads nicely, right? Get insult, then console log my insult, right? However, if there's an error, console log my error. You can kind of think of then and catch as like try catch, right? Kind of the same idea. And under the hood, that's literally what's happening. Anybody still typing? Yep, I'll just wait. No worries. OK, cool. So now if we open up our terminal or command prompt, I'm just going to say terminal just because it's easier. The black screen. If you open up the black void of death, press up, only it's not called async callback anymore now, it's called promises. So node promises. And hit enter, it takes a few seconds. You are as sick as an ugly, odious, apathetic heap of despicable, terrible cat orifices. That's my insult. Wow, that's painful. <laughs> that, is, that is a nailer. <laughs> now that's fine, because that's exactly the way the old one operated. But we have a change. We have something different this time. Let me show you what happens if we malform our insult and I say insults oh no right jump back to the black void of death press up and it should spit out our error isn't that wonderful isn't that so readable <laughs> but that is our error we get an error back it tells us what the problem is host name IP does not match certificates alt names and that's true because insults does not exist right it's obviously not very readable to you but it is correct. We get an error. So the actual rejection <laughs> that's happening in our code, this part right here, the catch, is functioning correctly. And we can kind of prove that if I just comment this out, jump back, clear my screen, press up, and enter. Oh no, no error. All right? Nicely suppressed. Gone. So what generally you will see in the industry when you're working at a company is they won't console log it out. They'll write it to a log, right? And then they'll be able to check their logs. So gives you an idea. OK, cool. So that's it for promises. Um, why don't we take a small break? When we come back, we'll do the quiz. You know what? I'll let you do the quiz after class, because we're going to run out of time otherwise. Definitely want to get the node server up, and definitely want to get it in onto Google repeat today. So uh, when we come back, we'll do some ES6 syntax. You'll learn some new syntax in JavaScript that'll take stuff like this and make it so much smaller. Okay? Uh, so let's take 15 minutes. Okay, so now we're going to learn something a little bit fun. So far, we've been coding. We have done a little bit of ES6 programming. Um, ES6 is still just JavaScript, right? So don't get confused. There's also ES7, ES8. There's a whole bunch of them, but Node is still using ES6. We're still back a little bit. In fact, uh, as of Node 8.1, we finally got uh, async and await, right? So it took eight versions before we got async and await, but async and await was released when Node was still in like Node 4 or something like that. It takes a little while for Node to adopt those things. Um, Node's at a good point right now, though, I think, like with because it has async and await, it has promises, it has a lot of the things that are going to help you reduce your code, right? And it supports ES6. So we've already done a little bit of ES6 programming. Let and const are from ES6. That's where they came from. Let and const were basically an answer to block scoped variables, which are supported in languages like C and Ruby. So a lot of people wanted block scope variables because it does kind of force you to do better practices, right? Because you shouldn't be um, you shouldn't be defining variables globally all the time. You should be able to define them in different areas, and they should maintain their scope within that block. 
So we've got let and const. So why don't we create a new file just in the same directory? I'm just going to call it es6.js. So what is es6? What, what the heck does that mean? So es6 stands for ECMAScript, right? ECMAScript version 6. It actually literally stands for ECMAScript 2016. And then in 2017, they released a new one. In 2018, they released another one. In 2019, they're going to do another one, right? So every single year, there's this new iteration of this thing. The ECMAScript is actually just a standard. That's all it is. It's just a standard. It's a specification document that says, hey, these are the new functions that we want to implement. If you want to say that you're ES6 um, uh, standardized, so if your browser, Chrome, is ES6 standardized, then you must have these methods and functions. They need to accept these, um, these arguments, and they need to return this type of value. Right? So you can kind of think of it like almost like interfaces or like a blueprint. Have you guys done blueprinting in like uh, JavaScript with interfaces? Have you used interfaces before? Yes, yes. Yeah, so you know how an interface is kind of like a blueprint, right? It says basically you need to accept this and return this. That's literally what it is. It's, it's, it's a blueprint that basically tells the Chrome browser, it tells whoever that wants to implement the specification that you must accept these arguments and uh, these specific data types and return this specific data type, right? Pretty easy, easy to use. However, it's, they don't force the browser to implement it in a certain way. So each browser actually handles the implementation in their own way. They just need to make sure that the function exists, right? So the way that Chrome handles let modifiers and the const modifier might be different than the way that Firefox does, or might be different than the way Safari does which incidentally can also be different than the way Node does, right? Because it's totally, again, their implementation of these specifications is completely up to them. So, uh, by the way, just a little off topic, the same applies to OpenGL, DirectX, Falcon, any of those type of video card drivers that are on your systems, the same deal uh, applies to them. That's why sometimes AMD will outperform NVIDIA in some operations, though rarely but sometimes in some operations, and NVIDIA will outperform in other operations. And again, that's because the implementations of those technologies are different, right? As long as they have the libraries, they're good, but their implementations can vary. Okay, so ES6, fantastic thing, and that's basically what we're going to program primarily in. Um, like I said, variable declaration, right? Like variable declaration. So we have const. I'm going to call this I am immutable equals some random value. Why don't we do tax? That's always a good one. Right? So const means constant. Believe it or not, for the longest time, JavaScript did not have a way to set <laughs> constant, which was terrible. That was really a bad idea, right? Because uh, almost every programming language has the ability to set a constant. Constants, the big key thing about a constant is they are immutable. They cannot be changed. Once they are set, they cannot be changed. The other big thing about constants in JavaScript is once you declare it, you must assign a value to it. If you don't assign a value to it, it will explode. Okay? Um, let, however, let, you do not have to assign a value to it at declaration. It will be set as undefined. It's implicit. Um, and because let is mutable, that's the reason why, because you can go set it whenever you want. So let's take a look at let. So let, you know, uh, what's a good let? Let's do favorite food, because it may change, right? What is my favorite food these days? Probably steak. Really like steak. There we go. I wish this little light bulb would not just occupy space. I mean, it's cool, but it just, it's like always in the wrong location. So const is immutable, let is mutable, meaning it can change. Now, often people use var. Var will earn you a negative half point every time I see it. Abandon var. Do not use var. I don't want to see var. I don't want to see get element by tag name, get element by ID or class. We are embracing ES6. It's been there since 2016. Let's not use this archaic stuff that is slow and blah, right? So let 
and const. That's what you need to use. No global variables either. That's also a bad thing. OK, so what else did ES6 give us? Well, at one point, when we wanted to do things like scope variables into a block, right? We had to do this crazy syntax. This thing was the most annoying thing in the world. It's called an iffy. They're gross. They're horribly gross. Notice the parentheses wrapping my function, right? Oop. There's my function. Oh, look at this. Now there's a set of parentheses after the function because that instantly invokes the function. And then inside here, I would use this horrible, horrible thing, this modifier called var. And I would go my, yeah, I lose a half point. Scoped var equals Bob. I'm even going to use double quotes. Like, let's just make this as gross as possible, right? Ugh. Iffy. The old way. And so iffy. Ugh. Yeah. There's an iffy. So what is an iffy? An iffy is an instantly invoked function execution. Basically what happens is this whole thing is going to execute immediately. It doesn't need to be called, it just automatically executes. Why would anybody do this? Well, the big reason why they do it is because they wanted to maintain scope within a certain area. The problem is, is var is only functionally scoped, which means it is only scoped within a function. So if you defined a variable in an if block, sorry, that variable is accessible outside of the if block. It's accessible out of a for loop. It's accessible outside of a while loop. So in order to combat that, people would use these horrible structures called ifies. Ifies are terrible. They're bad. They're a bad code idea, right? So that's why we now have constant let. Constant let are scoped to a block, meaning they are not accessible outside of the block. This same block, this same iffy can now be coded like this. That literally means the same thing. It instantly executes. This variable is only accessible within this block. That's it. Yay. And if you want a little bit more context, that is completely valid syntax. There's nothing wrong with that syntax. But, you know, you can always throw it. There you go. That's also instantly invoked, right? Because if true, we'll execute always. Because it's true, always. Both those things are exactly the same thing. <laughs> so the idea of being able to scope to a block is really handy. ES6 provides us that. It's essential, especially when you start working with things where you have... You know, you're using the same variable names in your code repeatedly because they have meaning, right? You chose that variable name because it has meaning. So you want to be able to use it throughout your code. You don't want to have to come up with 26 different versions of the same name. If you're breaking out a thesaurus, you're doing something wrong, okay? You shouldn't have to break out a thesaurus just to find variable names. So that's the whole point of having this wonderful scoping, so that you don't have to go through crazy steps just to be able to create variable names. All right, this is my favorite topic. This is the thing that a lot of people like, and then there's a lot of people who don't like them. These are called arrow functions. Arrow functions are awesome. Arrow functions are nice and condensed. You can write them in one line. <laughs> they, they do cool things, right? I, like the way they, they handle the context of this is really awesome. Arrow functions are very, very cool. However, they can be confusing to people because the syntax is kind of bizarre. It looks closer to like a lambda is really what it, well, that's what it is basically. Um, so let's write a function here. So we have function person, right? Here's my function. And I'm going to write this dot age. I think I've blown past the step here. Nope. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do var, yeah, the dirty var, var that equals this. This was the way we combated issues with the context of this. This is scoped to its owner function at all times. That's just the way it works. So if you write something that's another function inside here, it changes the context of this, which gets really super annoying because you'll go to access it and it won't work. 
I think an example is necessary for you to kind of see what's happening there. So I'm going to say that dot age equals zero. And then I'm going to write a nice little set interval in here. My set interval is going to take function, grow up, which means something entirely different in this era. And then I'm going to increment age. And then I'm going to console.log age and give this a thousand. And that's a lot of stuff there, right? <clears throat> so the reason why I have to provide that is because when I come into here, this is a new function. This is new owner scope. So if I try to access this in here, it's not that one. It's not at all. I am creating a new instance inside here and doing something completely different. I'm not affecting the thing that I think I'm affecting, which is really problematic and part of one of the biggest reasons that people hate the way context of this is in JavaScript, because that is specifically JavaScript that's annoying like that. So the way we combat that is by assigning this to that. This is gross. This is, this is not good code. This is hackish, right? And it's not something we want to do. So let's uh, go ahead and instantiate that just so you can kind of see it. So we'll do let peep equal new person. There we go. Create a new object. <coughs> And if I open up my node terminal and do node es6.js and hit enter, I'm going to get a wonderful block issue. Right, age is not defined because I'm not referencing it. I need to reference it correctly. Whoops. This dot age. Keep that up. It's going to just keep saying undefined, undefined, undefined. You know why it's saying undefined, undefined, undefined? Because the context of this, oops, control C, the context of this is within here, right? And I don't have this dot H defined. It's not even there, right? So to fix that, I just change this to that. Jump back over, press up, and boom, everything works just fine dandy. But like I said, it's hackish. It's gross. It's not what you want. It's not the way you would expect it to operate. What did you change to? I changed line right here from this to that. <laughs> so what's cool is we actually have arrow functions available to us now from ES6. And the nice thing about arrow functions is they actually maintain the context of the owner function they were defined in which means this will actually carry into here for us automatically, right? So let's, uh, let's refactor our code a little bit with arrow functions. So first I'm going to write gross ass non arrow function. There we go. Now I'm going to write arrow bun Bun function. These are the best ones. All right. We already have our function person, but we're going to blow it out of the water and rewrite it. Function person. What is wrong with me? Why do I do things like this? Oh, no, I had to do that. That's never mind. Ignore that question. Please don't answer. It was. <laughs> It's definitely rhetorical. Definitely. <laughs> All right, so this dot age is zero, right? Let's write set interval again, just like we did the last time. Only inside here, we are going to use the magical arrow function. All right? Step one to the syntax of an arrow function, a set of parentheses. That is step one. In this particular scenario, because there are like seven different ways to write an arrow function. Step two, on the right-hand side of that set of parentheses, 
press space, press equals, press greater than, hence the arrow. The guy I work with calls them hash rockets. I think he does a lot of hash. Um, <laughs> then the last piece is the block, which is just a set of curly braces, right? If you look at it, it is very similar to the way a function is defined. Right? They aren't really that different. <laughs> now set interval. This is one argument. This whole piece here is one argument. We need the second argument. Okay. Then put your cursor inside those curly braces. Wind up your finger. Press enter. Put some separation between those. Best part of this, we get to use this. Glad that landed with one person. <laughs> Console.log, this.age. Notice this is just carrying through, right? We're not changing our context because we don't have to because the this that's here is the same this that automatically gets bound to here. Okay? If we wanted to do the same thing above, we can. There is a way. There is a magical way. It's called bind. Bind allows us to actually take our context and pass it to it. But it's convoluted. It doesn't, it doesn't flow as beautifully as this does, right? So just to make things a little simpler for us, we're going to highlight our other function with the instantiation and comment that guy out. Uh, by the way, I'm commenting by hitting command and the forward slash. You can do it with control in the forward slash, and it will auto-comment whatever's highlighted. Once all that's commented out, I'm going to define my next one, so I'm just going to do, I mean, come on, let's not be lazy. Let's be super lazy. Move that guy down, uncomment it, save it. So that's what your entire arrow fun fun function looks like. Not sure if you guys remember, but in the JavaScript class, I recommended watching the fun fun function guy. I recommend that in this class too, because he does like big node sections and React and basically anything JavaScript, but he does. So it's definitely worthwhile, still applicable to watch him. All right, now go ahead and open up your terminal. And clear it. Execute. Two, three, four. Looks that nice. But definitely much more readable. Feels like it makes sense, right? Arrow functions, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. <coughs> so incidentally, there is a whole slew of different ways to write arrow functions. Let's give you some examples. This is a valid way to write an arrow function. So arrow function syntaxes, is that how it would go? I'm going to say yes. All right, first syntax. I have parameters, and I want to pass them to my block. OK, param1, param2, inside my parentheses, my arrow or my hash rocket. And then I'm going to return param1, and why not just concatenate it to param2? Ta-da! This doesn't like this because it's not a named function, so it's kind of mad about it. If you hover over it, it like freaks out because it's not assigned to anything. So let's assign it to something. Const uh, multi params equals. There we go. We've assigned it to something. <coughs> All right. What if I only have one parameter? I only have one parameter. Like, I can write it like this. I'm totally okay to do that. Param1 and my block and then return param1. 
right? Oh, I better do this. One param. <coughs> Go. But what I can also do, because I only have one parameter, I can actually drop these parentheses. I don't need to pass them. If I have multiple parameters, then I have to wrap them in parentheses. But if I only have one, I can ditch them. I only have one parameter. Right? Incidentally, because I only have one return statement here, and I'm not doing any other logic in here, I can go even one step further. Because I'm only returning one param, I'm going to say const return one param equals param1 hash rocket param1. Because that literally says take param1, pass it over here, and return it all in one line. The return is implicit, which means it's automatic, it's implied. Okay. So what if I have no parameters? Well, no parameters, very easy, just an open set of parentheses with an arrow. Give it a block, return, hi. Need to assign it off. No params. Now, because I'm only returning high, I can actually just get away with doing const greeting equals and that means literally the same thing. It's ridiculous though, because I'm just assigning high off. <laughs> to greeting. But I'm actually signing a function definition, right? Greeting isn't executing. Greeting is not going to have the value high in it. Greeting is going to have the value of this function definition in it. So it is a little different. Remember that disgusting iffy? Sometimes you need to write them. Sometimes. Especially if you're doing like async and await stuff and you just need to do a bunch of await statements, yeah, fortunately you're going to have to wrap it in an async iffy. So I'll show you what an iffy looks like. We're not going to use async yet though, but I will show you what the iffy looks like with arrow functions. So let's write this. Iffy the not so dirty way. There we go. Set of parentheses to encapsulate everything we're about to do. Another set of parentheses to basically say this is an iffy, or an arrow function. That block, return, hi, execute the block, done. Get away from there, you silly fluorescent light bulb. Do you have to squint to see? Yeah. Uh, this room is bad in the sense that you're either at a very awkward angle trying to see this board. Like, I can't imagine poor Joe over there. How can you even see Joe <laughs> from that angle? It must be difficult. Or you're, like, dead center to the board, and you're fine, right? But there's, like, only one row. It's a really weirdly set up classroom. But, yeah. Okay, so that's an iffy, but that's kind of like the good iffy. And this is something you'll use. I use iffies. I've been using iffies a lot, actually, because we're performing um, a bunch of code that I need to await things for. We're using Google's Lighthouse API, and it does requests. And in order to wait for the requests, I need to wrap the whole thing in an async block. So I use an iffy in order to do that. So we, we may write one of these uh, in the future. All right. There is a beautiful table, if I say so myself, that has every version of this written in it with a description of how it works and how you do it. And that's in the lesson notes that I provided you. Okay? So you can find that in there. Uh, 656. We should probably talk about destructuring. So, a couple of steps. Destructuring. Let's start with 
arrays. What destructuring is, is basically destructuring is giving a list of variable names and then signing a list of values. Well, when we think about lists in programming, we think of arrays, right? So you give an array of names and an array of values. And you can literally say this array of names is now equal to this array of values. And it literally takes each of the values and immediately signs it to each one of the, um, the array names. And that looks kind of like this. So um, you can give your declarator in front of it, decorator, your square brackets to denote an array. I'm going to create A, B, and C, because <laughs> examples are hard. <laughs> and they're going to have the values of 1, 2, and 3, because <laughs> again, examples are hard. So what will happen is A will have the value of 1, B the value of 2, and C will have the value of 3. Those each will have those variable values. So let's do a console log just to see that. Console.log A, B, C. Notice I didn't wrap these with the square brackets. These are just variables, right? Remember how in console log you can give a list of things to spit out? So now I've got A, B, C. And if you open up your terminal, Keep in mind that the set interval is still going to be iterating. So my, there you go, one, two, three, right? And then this thing goes, just ignore that thing. So destructuring with arrays, very handy, something you will use quite often. But destructuring with objects is probably the thing you will do most because it allows you to take the values inside the objects and assign them off to a list of uh, variable names. Now the thing is, is destructuring with objects is a bit bizarre because say I have a student, right? The student has first name, last name, and age, right? The list of variable names that I am assigning off to that object have to be those same keys. It's basically just extracting the keys and now making the variable names that you now have access to. So I'll show you what I mean. Let's do objects. We will create a student, const student equals name. You can do your name. I'll do my name. ID, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And age, 40. Now, in order to assign that off into actual variable names, you create a set of curly braces. And the easiest way to remember destructuring syntax is if it's an array, it's square brackets is equal to square brackets. If it's an object, it's curly braces are equal to curly braces. Okay, That's the easiest way to remember it. Name, ID, and age is equal to student. And then we can console log that out. Name, ID, and age. I love how my thing just goes <coughs> for you. Sorry about that. It's the printifier says that's the syntax you're supposed to use. <laughs> yep. If I console log it, I should see all those out. Oh, right, this is, um, right, I did know this. Uh, actually, you have to wrap it, I think, like that. Or no, sorry, no, you have to wrap it. It's really stupid. Like that, I think it is. Hold on. Yes, sorry, that's the way it is. You have to wrap it in a set of parentheses, the whole equation, like the whole expression. I'm not sure why that is the way it is, but that's the way it is. To me, it seems a little convoluted. I wonder if I can actually pull those up now so that they're not on different lines, bizarrely. Nope, still wants to do it. <laughs> so it might not seem obvious where destruction is used, but you will wind up using it with Mongo records a lot. 
destructuring out to the separate variables because it's much easier just to reference the variables than you know record dot name record dot id right you can just do name id h last but not least remember prototyping as people shudder and twitch their eyes right <laughs> Prototyping, for those of you that don't know, you'll be quite happy because you'll never need to know. Prototyping is our way of doing basically inheritance in JavaScript, working with objects, working with classes kind of in, in JavaScript. JavaScript doesn't have classes, right? Those are not something that exists. It's not an object-based oriented programming language that way. Objects are automatically there. They exist instantaneously. However, ES6 was basically the first to try to remedy that because a lot what was happening basically is a lot of you guys for example were coming from languages like java or class based languages coming into javascript and going where's the classes and we're like prototypes dude what the fuck <laughs> right and then just walking away from it because prototypes were like crazy so classes do exist now it is important to understand that under the hood though it's still prototype it's still just prototype. It's actually syntactic sugar, um, which means that Evan goes through a transpiling step. So classes are technically a vanilla JavaScript purist, those super nerds. They're going to go, well, dude, it's technically prototype, so you're technically taking longer to execute your code than I am, right? But just ignore that guy. Because Node is going to transpile anyways, so it's irrelevant. So let me show you what classes look like. You're going to be so excited because they basically look like the same classes you use in Java or in C++. It's literally the keyword class, right? Nice, familiar, feels comfortable, doesn't it? Let's uh, let's do superhero because that's my favorite thing, right? Then a set of braces. That is class syntax. Now. I'll show you one of the little idiosyncrasies that I tend to do. I like to put some space between my opener and closer, so I like to add three lines. I don't know why, that's just me. I like to do that. Though I bet your prettifier is just going to go, and shrink it all up. Classes have constructors. Nice, eh? Constructor. No writing constructor methods for prototyping. Now you have constructor right in there. Um, secret. ID, their name, and origin. There we go. Those are good ones. And then I can assign. This part is going to seem a little familiar. This dot secret ID equals secret ID, right? There are libraries that actually make this a little nicer, that can actually create setters and getters for you immediately. Uh, they're not hugely important. That's our constructor method. Creating new methods inside a class, and I do use the word method here, even though it is technically not true, but um, they look a little different. In PHP, when you want to create a method inside a class, you define the word function, just like you would define any function, right? In JavaScript, it's a little different. So if I want to create um, a method in here, I would do it like this. Origin story. Did I really? You said nothing. Way to go. <laughs> All right. Let's use some backticks in here and do a console log. Um, yeah, I'm super lazy. Secret, oh, nope, sorry, this dot secret ID is from origin. <laughs> there we go. That is a class. Gets better. We have inheritance, <coughs> right? So superhero, for example, could inherit from a person class. You just simply write class. Um, actually, let's go the other way. Person extends 
superhero. And then you write your logic in there just like you would with the regular class, with your constructor and whatever else you want. Now, just for the sake of time, I did breeze over a few things. Um, if you look at the notes, which I recommend always doing, there's a little bit more details about destructuring. There's even a little bonus piece in there that shows you. You remember how we do for in loops, but one of the deep, like one of the one of the issues with for in loops is it only iterates through object keys. There's actually a way to get it to spit out object key and values. Um, so there's a little bit of a bonus in there if you want to see that. Uh, other than that, that is ES6 in a nutshell. Any questions about ES6? No? Cool. I mean, it's in the notes, right? Um, awesome. I will do another break, but, but, I want to get through NPM first. Let's nick this off so it's done, and then we can kind of gauge where we are in time, right? Because I would like to try to deploy today if we can. If not, if we don't get to deploy today, I'll obviously push the lab to the following week, and we'll deploy next week, right? But let's see where we can actually get to. <coughs> okay, cool. Oh, right, because there's a whole whack of stuff we need to do here. So go ahead and close all these off. I will zip this up for you and publish this as a zip file onto Blackboard. So all these files will be in Blackboard. So if you did have any difficulties with your code, you can always make a comparison. Okay? Take a look, see what I did, compare it to what you did. That's what I recommend doing. All right, let's uh, close these guys off. We're going to need a few steps. This is the first part of our project that we're going to start working on week to week. So this whole recap, refresher, review piece and a little bit of an intro to ES6 is now done. Each week we'll be working on our project and slowly building out our blogging platform. We're going to be working in the same folder at all times, so take some special care to creating this folder. I don't care where you create it. If you want to create it in documents, go for it, downloads, doesn't matter. Just pay attention to where you're actually creating it. You don't need to make a week by week folder. You can if you want to, if that's how you want to keep track of your stuff. You don't need to though. Because what we're going to do is we're going to use git branching to keep track of each week. So you should, as long as you don't delete your branches, you will have a branch that will literally represent every single week, right? And you can actually see the progression grow with your blog from week to week to week. Um, the master branch will be the one that we're actually going to wind up deploying to Heroku. So each working branch will be the one that we work with locally and look at locally our production because that's what it's called, our production branch will be master. Okay? So let's do that step first. Jump over to GitHub. All right? Jump over to GitHub. Go ahead and sign in or sign up if you don't have a GitHub account. All right? Sign into GitHub. On the left hand side here, you should see repositories and there's a new button, right? Go ahead and click new to create a new repository. And the cool thing is, is every single one of us can literally name it the exact same thing. It doesn't matter, but it's completely up to you what you call it. If you have like a particular name you want to call your blog, that's totally fine. Um, I'm just going to call mine comp2068 dash blog, just so I know what it is, blogging projects, oh I better also prepend that with Monday, just so we know, oh right, I forgot, it has to be lowercase. I'm going to make mine public, and I recommend you do the same, because I will show you properly how not to commit credentials that are sensitive. All right, so we will take advantage of environment variables on our system and environment variables in production. So you don't need to worry about your code being posted publicly because it doesn't matter because all of your credentials will be hidden, right? So this is something to become aware of. That being said, you, it's completely up to you if you want to make it private. That's totally up to you, okay? But you don't need to because the credentials will be hidden anyways. 
All right, initialize it with a readme. It just makes it a little easier for doing the copying and, and uh, cloning, right? Once you're done, click Create Repository. Takes a few seconds. To Bluey, we have a new repository with a bit of a readme in there. Feel free to fill out your readme. I mean, learning markup for 10 seconds of your life is a waste of time, but <laughs> you should know how to write readmes. I don't know how to write readmes. Yeah, just do it in text editor and then spit it out as markup. <laughs> yeah, and paste it in. Alrighty. So this interface, I'm not sure how much experience you have with it. This is where we actually do the cloning, right? You click on the clone, you copy the thing, right? This is where your branch controls are, okay? The way Git works, you start with a master branch where all of your stuff goes. And when you want to create a new feature or a new thing, it's usually a good idea to create a duplicate of your branch, right? And the reason is, is because then that feature or whatever it is you're working on doesn't contaminate the main branch. When you're done, you can then take that branch and merge it in. And if you break your production, which happens on occasion, you can roll back. That's the whole power of Git. The idea is that you're not landlocked to any particular state in time. You can always go backwards in time, right? And that happens by using Git properly, right? Not blowing things away. I will tell you the same thing I tell absolutely everybody. If you are typing dash F, which means force push, if you're trying to be a Jedi and do force push, you are going to F your branch. Consider dash F as meaning F branch, okay? That's the best way to think of that. So if you're doing dash F, you need to stop, think about what you're doing, and if that's your solution to dealing with conflicts, that is the wrong solution. Don't be millennial. <laughs> Head it straight on, okay? Uh, especially when you guys are working in groups, which your labs are also based on, so you can do them in your groups. Make sure you've signed your group into the group sign-up form, please. Um, if you're doing it in your groups, you obviously don't want to overwrite each other. So the best way to do that is split your lab into multiple branches, one branch per person. They work on a specific thing, and then they do, like, they commit to the master branch, right? That's the best way to do that. Okay, shut up and create a branch. So under branch master right there, click the down arrow, right? This thing right here is blank, but if you read it, it says find or create a branch. So let's type in a new branch name. So I'm going to call it part-01. When I type in part-01, it says create branch part-01. That's actually a button. If you bring your mouse down, you'll highlight it, click it, we now have a branch, and notice this thing has switched you over to the branch. You can see it right here. If you want to switch back to master, just click the down arrow, click on master, and you'll switch back. Okay? When you create a branch, right, you're creating it from master. You are duplicating master and creating your branch. Okay? So it will always be a duplicate. That you actually have more power than that. You can actually create a branch of another sub-branch. So I could create another branch from part one, duplicate part one, and create a totally different branch and work on that, and then merge that into just part one. You have those kind of control. We're just going to keep it nice and simple. Master, part one, next week we'll do part two, next following we'll do part three, and we'll just keep doing that, okay? Cool. Let's clone it. So click on the clone. Make sure that this says use SSH and you're in here because if it says use HTTPS, you need to click that, right? Unless you guys have SSH keys and you understand how that works. Click the little copy thing or just copy it. Totally up to you. I'm going to click the little copy thing. All right. Open up your terminal. We need to navigate into our terminal to a place that makes the most sense to create this clone, okay? I'm going to type in cd. cd is going to put me in my home directory. I can see that if I'm on Windows by typing dir. If I'm in Mac, PowerShell, or Linux, I type pwd. pwd shows me that I'm in my user Sean McKinnon directory. 
If you are okay with your project going in there, then that's totally fine. If you have a specific place that you want to put your project in, then you need to navigate there. The easiest way I find new people working with Shell to navigate to a location is to open up your Finder or your Windows Explorer, navigate inside there to where you need to go, right? So I'm going to put this in my Georgian folder, for example, under Dropbox. So here's my Georgian folder, right? I'm going to Comp 2068. I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it uh, Projects. I'm going to create a new folder in there and call it Monday just for you guys. All right, so now I'm ready to create my project in this folder. I'm going to grab this folder and drag it into the terminal and it will auto populate the path. All right? Now, don't just populate the path and hit enter. We need to CD into there, so just press your back cursor until you get to the beginning of the line, type CD, hit enter, and you should be into the path. <coughs> okay? That's where I'm creating mine. You don't need to create it in the exact same spot. You can create it wherever you are comfortable with. When we clone it, it's going to put it in a directory. It's not just going to take the files and dump them into whatever directory you're in. It will create it in my scenario, comp2068 block. That's where it will create it. So now I'm ready to actually go ahead and clone it. So I'm going to type in git. Actually, I think a good idea is a git dash v. No, it's git dash dash version. Yes. Type git space dash dash version and make sure this says git something or other. If it doesn't, it means you don't have git on your system and you will need to install git. Just ballparking. How many people don't have Git? Okay. <laughs> Not a word. You're on Mac, right? Yeah. Um, what are you using? Windows? Okay, he's using Windows. Sorry, I don't know his name. Um, if you type in download Git in Google, yeah, there it is. It's Git SCM. There's three different versions. One for Windows, one for Mac, one for Linux. Go ahead and run the install. If you run that install, then you will get the Git that you need for your version. Yes, Satesh? No. Like, yeah, I think they're actually up way further in Git than 2.17, but I've never had a reason to upgrade. Oh, OK, yeah, no, it doesn't matter. As long as you can do Git clone, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, the term get installed. You don't have to install. It's possible you don't have it installed in PowerShell. So you might be able to access it from command prompt, but not PowerShell. Which is weird, but it is possible. <laughs> yes, Cabal. Is it possible to change the drive in the PowerShell? Yeah, you can just do CD and then whatever the name of the drive. Like, you kind of have to work your way through, right? So in Windows, it kind of goes, so it would be CD. You have to do C like that to tell it which directory you're, like which drive you're in. And is it home? I can't remember. It's either user or home. It's been so freaking long since I've been on Windows. Yeah, you just kind of have to navigate through. <laughs> it's much easier to just drag and drop. Can you drag and drop into PowerShell? Or does it not allow it? Yeah. Come on. Does it let you drag and drop the folder into PowerShell? Yeah, I would do it that way. It would be a lot easier. <laughs> Now, in this thing, when it comes up, there's some options it's going to provide. Just leave the default options. Just don't change them. Because the most important thing is that we want Git on your path, so that when we type Git into Command Prompt or PowerShell, it's available to us. If you deselect to add it to the path, it won't be available to us. Okay? And then it goes into a long scenario of us adding it to your path, which is annoying because I have to remember where it is. <laughs> I always forget. It's under environment variables somewhere. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you have to close your terminal or reopen. Once you, once you install it, you have to close the open terminal and reopen it and then try get dash dash version. Did it work, Angela? Okay. All right. I'm so sorry, but if you are behind, we will catch up together afterwards. Um, just make sure you're in your directory. I'm going to clone. The way we clone the command is git clone and then paste that address in that you copied from GitHub. Okay? It should end in .git. Just so you know, if you are comfortable using the interface, you can use the interface. That is totally okay. I have no problem with you using GitHub Desktop or whatever it is you're using. Just, I use it this way, so it's totally up to you. All right, I'm going to hit enter. It's going to clone. And if everything works, you should see a couple of remote um, lines there go through. And then it should tell you it's unpacking the objects. And everything should be done. Okay. Now, we are in the Monday directory, but we want to be in the directory where our GitHub project is, right? So the way we do that is, one, we can check to see what the GitHub name is for that project folder. If you're on Windows, you type DIR. If you're on Mac, you type LS. It will list the directories available to you and any files inside that, that um, structure. Then you just simply CD the name of it and hit enter. If you're in PowerShell, it should tell you that you're in a Git branch. It should also tell you what Git branch you're on. Hopefully. Is it not that cool? Fuck PowerShell. Um, <laughs> terminal does. Command prompt won't. <laughs> Command prompt just won't. If you want it to look pretty like this, download Fish if you're on Mac or on, on Windows. Fish will actually give you more of this type of stuff. All right. We want to switch branches. In order to switch branches, currently this system does not know about the other branches yet. We haven't told it what the other branches are. The way we pull down the other branches so that we can actually look at those other branches, so that we can see what's available to us, we do git fetch and hit enter. That's going to fetch all the current branches up inside our repository and bring them down to us. It's really just an index list is what it's pulling down. It's not actually pulling down the information. And I want to access that branch and check it out. Right? I want to check out that branch. So I'm going to type in git checkout. And I can even hit tab, and it will just auto list all the branches for me that are available. And the one I want to access is part one and hit enter. So if you type in git checkout space tab, it should list the branches for you. If it doesn't, try starting to type one of the branch names and hit tab, and then it should autofill it. Is it not doing any of the things that I'm saying? Not really. What did you call your branch? I guess you just don't get the nice info, which is kind of annoying because then you have to remember what the branch is called. I mean, it's in GitHub. Fish is, yeah, it's like fish, and it's it's the same kind of terminal that I'm using. Fish. I think. I've never actually used fish. I just know it's it's like the go-to for Windows users that don't want to deal with PowerShell or, yeah, anything like that. What's that? Yeah, that's totally fine. That's actually not master branch. It's master branch. Check out. 
All right, so now that we're on the part one branch, so now that we're on the part one branch, we can actually open that folder inside our IDE. So go ahead, navigate to that folder, open it up inside your IDE so that you have it open. So I'm going to go in here, I'm going to go to File, Open. I'm going to navigate to my ID, like to where that folder is, which is nested so far. And open. Cool. And if you've got it open, you should see the readme file in there. <coughs> oh yeah, we're definitely not doing a lot today. <laughs> But we will at least get the server working, so that should be good. And then we'll merge and do everything on Monday, uh, next Monday. All right, right. You are not here next Monday. I will slow down for Thursday's class as well. So Thursday will be right where you guys are. So the following week's Thursday class, you need to watch on YouTube, right, so that you can catch up. The notes will be posted though. Right? So the notes are there. You're welcome to read the notes. The notes will be posted for you so that they're available on Monday. But you don't have class because it's the May 2-4 weekend, right? So there's no class on the Monday. Are you guys off the Friday too? Do you get a four-day weekend? Just three days? I don't know. I don't know if you get a four-day. <laughs> Alrighty. Let's just get through these last few steps and then we can call it a night. All right, so we're going to introduce Node Package Manager. The package managers, basically, uh, they're available in many different languages. PHP uses Composer. Ruby uses Gems. C++ has their, like, Ming database. Uh, Java, I'm sure, has a package manager as well. They're all, there's tons of different package managers. Node uses uh, NPM. That's the package manager it uses. Um, so we're going to use NPM, and then when we get into React, we'll actually start working with Yarn, but they both access the same repository system. So package managers are basically a simple way to grab vendor libraries. So libraries that are available out in the wild. So today we use the HTTPS library, but it's built into to Node. There was a time where you actually had to download that library and utilize it. Package managers make that easy. Our main library we're going to be working with is Express. Express is a package that's uh, available to Node, and we have to actually download the Express library. So package managers make that really, really simple because they'll download all the required files for you, and not only will they download the library, they'll download all of its dependencies. So you don't have to go figure out what the dependencies are because they're going to come with the actual module. So it maintains all that for you. And if there's dependencies for another Node module, and it requires the same dependencies, instead of it downloading it twice, it will download it once and then link them up for you. It takes away all the magic and mystery for you. It automatically makes it easy for you. There are a couple of steps though. Inside our command prompt, in order to work with NPM, we actually have to say that this is an NPM project. So in order to do that, we're going to run something called NPM init. The cool thing about this is that we have NPM already. The second you download a node, you immediately received a version of NPM. All right? So we can type NPM init dash Y. And the reason why I'm typing dash Y is because if I don't, I get a whole whack of questions. Like, what do I want to call this thing? I'm going to call it that thing. What's my version? I think 1.0 is perfectly fine. What's the description? I don't want to do that. Uh, what's my entry point file? It's not index.js. It's actually app.js, but I can just change that in the JSON file. What's my test command? None of your business. What's the Git repository? Who cares? Keywords, not important. Author, me. License, I don't know. <laughs> is this OK? Sure. So you got to go through that every single time you do an init, right? which is really tedious. So the easiest way to do it is just do dash y, which automatically answers yes to all those questions, and you know. 
I'm pretty sure it's dash y. It might be dash t. Did anybody try it? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> it's live, folks. <laughs> All right. So if you did it correctly, you should notice a new file called package.json. Let's go ahead and open that guy up. If you open up the package.json file, you'll see a whole bunch of information. There's a couple things you need to change. Where it says main, just change that to app.js. That's the first piece that you need to change. <coughs> okay. The second thing we're going to need to change is right here where it says scripts. These are the scripts that NPM has accessible to it. And the cool thing about these scripts, these are really just bash commands, right? You guys are taking Linux right now. I think some of you are taking Linux. So you're going to learn about bash commands, I'm hoping. <laughs> um, you can actually type raw bash commands in there, assign them to a name, test, and then in order to run that, you just run npm run test, and it will execute that bash command for you. So we're going to create a bash command for ourselves. So put a comma at the end of the test one, hit enter. In quotes, we're going to call this start. And then our bash command, super simple. How have we been executing our scripts so far? What keyword are we using to execute our scripts inside the command prompt? Node, right. Node, and then the name of our file, which will be app.js. So it's the same thing, just now we're going to encapsulate it with start. <laughs> All right, so this is cool. We have our package file. Everything is good, but we're not done yet. We still don't have a node modules folder. And the reason why we don't have a node modules folder is because we have no dependencies. We, we literally haven't installed any libraries, right? So we're going to install our first library. Jump back over to your command prompt. And in order to install a library, we can install it in three different ways. We can install it at the global level, which means it will be available to us globally throughout our system, right? Which means every single thing we have in our system will have access to this particular module. We can install it local to this project, which is the way you will install it most times, right? And you can install it as a developer dependency, which means it's only available while you're in a development environment, which is your machines, right? Which means when you deploy to Heroku, that module will not be available on Heroku, but it will be available to you locally, okay? Because it takes a look at your environment. Don't worry about that yet. We'll deal with something like that later on. I'll find something specifically. Actually, Jest. We'll be using testing environments, so we'll do Jest. Um, for now, you're going to do npm. In order to install a package, it's install or just i. You can do either one. The name of the package, which is express. And sometimes some versions of Node support just that, and you can hit enter. Others, unfortunately, you have to do dash dash save. So I'm going to recommend you just do dash dash save just to save us a little bit of pain right now. When you're done, hit enter. It's going to look like it's doing a whole bunch of stuff. It's reaching out to the internet. Look at that, 48 packages it grabbed and pulled down, right? And installed those for you, and you now have Express Server ready to go. The way we know this all works, if you jump back inside your package.json file, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll notice now you have a dependencies key, and there's a dependency in there, express 4.16. You'll also notice that you now have a node modules folder. If you open it, you will see a whole whack of stuff available to you that came with express. There's a lot of stuff in there, and a lot of it we will be using. A lot of good utilities in there too, like array flatten and stuff like that that are kind of handy. <coughs> so now we've kind of made a bit of a lie. We told package.json that we're going to have an app.js file, but we don't actually have an app.js file yet. So in order for us to create a server, we are definitely going to need an app.js file. So go ahead, right click, choose to create a new file called app.js. Just ignore my ES lint issue.
just because we're motoring along, um, underneath the NPM section of the lesson notes, I also teach you how to remove NPM modules, how to update them and stuff. I recommend looking over that. Uh, we're not doing middleware. We already did that. All right. First thing we're going to do is actually import a library, which we already know how to do. What is our keyword for importing a library? It starts with an R. Yep, require. So we're going to do const. I'm going to call it express. You can literally call it whatever you want, but express is usually the common thing to call it. Require express. So the first part is importing the libraries that we need. Express is fantastic. Express is going to take care of so much heavy lifting for us. Um, I will post my modules from last semester uh, with this particular course. Um, we actually do this with the heavy lifting. We load in a connect module. We interpret the request. We deliver the correct file and stuff. And it's real, like a lot of work. I'm just bypassing it because you'll never do that. You'll always ever use Express because it just makes sense. So, but I will load it just for those of you that want to know. The next thing, we have Express, but we need to actually ex assign Express. So Express is a function. We actually have to execute it, which will return back an object to our application that we can use. So we're going to assign that to app, and we just call Express like you would call any function. That now basically creates an application listener and assigns it to app, and we now have this listener that we can use, which will actually listen to inbound requests, uh, whether they're get or post. I think it actually also listens to put and to patch and to other ones as well. I could be wrong. That, that I might actually be wrong about. So cool. We have Express. We have an app. There's one extra piece that we need to finish out this server before we create routes. And that's the port we want to listen on. So we're going to say app dot listen, which takes two arguments. The first argument is the port you want to listen on, which is actually the only argument you require. So we're going to listen on 4,000. And then a callback function, if you want to do a callback function. So we're going to create a callback function, and we're going to use arrow functions to do it, which we will use primarily in this class. And I'm just going to do a console log that basically says the app is listening on port 4000. <coughs> Before we write our routes, I'm just going to give a quick explanation, like two minutes tops, on what middleware is. Middleware is not like exclusive to JavaScript. Middleware exists in all languages. It's a programming paradigm. And what the idea is that I have two pieces of software that need to communicate with each other, but they don't know how. They don't speak the same language. So what I do is I create a tiny little piece of software in the middle that understands both sides, right? It takes the information coming in here and transmits it to the information to what this application can understand. Middleware is a fantastic essential piece to programming, especially large scale systems, right? For example, we're using AWS Lambda at work. The Lambda is essentially our little middleware, right? We use something called SQS, which is a trigger library. People pop messages on in JSON. SQS transmits that to Lambda, Lambda comprehends what it is, and then executes the appropriate function based on that. You guys did uh, MVC last semester, right? Routing? You guys all did routing, right? We had to create routes, paths, so slash home, slash about, slash whatever, and then based on the path that the person navigated to, you executed a function, correct? That route, that thing that you created, was middleware. It interpreted the request coming in, translated it into something that the application can understand and then called the appropriate thing. That is the most simplistic way I can explain middleware. There is a very intense, long diatribe in the lesson notes that you're welcome to read through that will explain it even further. If you want the closest like real world example that probably only Cynthia and I will understand, it's an operator. <laughs> it's essentially the person that used to plug phone lines in 
to connect multiple people. That's what it is. And Alan probably gets it too. <laughs> not, to date, not to age people here, but yeah, it's an operator. Okay, cool. So Express is an operator. It's a routing system that interprets requests and then casts them out. Today, we are going to do everything in one file. As we progress, we're going to split it out and we're going to wind up with a routing file, a controller file, a model file, and a view file. So we'll wind up modularizing our application, um, which is the best way to do that. A lot of people you will notice in Node will actually do everything within one file, but it gets convoluted, right? So I find this is a little easier to understand. So let's create a route. So app, then we tell it the protocol that we want to listen to, or sorry, the request type we want to listen to, which is a get, listening to a get request. The first argument it takes is the path, right? The request path that we want to listen to. I want to listen to slash, which is literally the root. So when they navigate to my site, it'll be like the first thing they hit. It's the root of my site. Then I give it a callback function, which I'm going to use our very handy arrow functions and give it the two parameters it's going to receive. I think I'm going to have to turn off hinting because it's really annoying. So the first piece is the path. The second argument is a function definition, right? It's just an anonymous function. We're giving it two parameters to catch placeholders for us, request and response. That's what they literally stand for. You know what? Why don't we write it out just for the sake of this one so you fully understand what those things are and spell it correctly. <laughs> English is hard. All right, now we can send out a response. So the request object will actually contain information about the user agent. So you might remember I explained a little bit to the semester last semester, but I didn't explain it to you guys. Request is basically how a person communicates with another server, right? When they type the address into the address bar, that creates a request. That request goes through the internet, and in our scenario, is going to come to us. That request is going to contain headers and a message body. And we can actually take that information and decide what we want to do with it to give them the appropriate response. We're taking a look at the path that they're doing. Sorry, Express is actually taking a look at the path they're accessing. It's going to pass in their request, and then it gives us a response object. The response object is ours. It's our way to be able to communicate back to the user. Right? Whatever we send through the response should reach the user. That's the idea. That's our goal. So we're going to do a very simple response. We're not going to respond with any HTML or JSON or anything like that. Just response dot send. Uh, why don't we write welcome to our very plain site. Or whatever you want. Totally up to you. Let's create one more route just so we have that experience, right? Same syntax, exactly the same syntax. You could even duplicate it if you wanted to. App.get slash, uh, call it whatever you want. Just give it a path name that makes sense to you. I'm going to do mine as about. An arrow function. This is where you can see. why block scope is so awesome, right? Look, I'm using the same two variable names again, and they're not going to conflict because they're block scoped, right? That's why it becomes so handy. Could you imagine if for every single route you had to come up with a new version of request and response using a thesaurus to figure out a new name, right? That'd be painful as painful could be. Again, response.send. It was a cold, dark, rainy day in Pizzaville. Yes, my pop culture references are about as old as they get. The rainy day in Pizzaville. No, it's not. Were they really? I was like, I was twelve. No, I was younger. Really? I was like 
eight or nine when those commercials first came out. Oh my god, that's funny. That is lazy. That's lazy writing. <laughs> so congratulations, you created a node server. That's literally it. That's a node server. In fact, you didn't even need all that. You only needed the three lines. Line one, line three, line 13, and that's a node server. Yeah? If I did like app post, would that be like the same thing as a post? Yes, it would be. That's exactly it. And then if you gave it a post body, it would go to the server as a post body. So what would happen though is app.post would be listening for post requests. So it would be listening for the user to send a form. Yeah, some sort of post request. And you can actually also use Ajax on the front because you can also use put and delete. So the user could actually send an update command and update, uh, uh, send a delete command and you could perform operations based on those two things. The only downfall to that is the user has to be using JavaScript on the front to do that. So React allows us to do that, but other applications don't. All right, obviously you want to run this thing. So go ahead, jump to your command prompt, and you're just going to type npm start. Hit enter. If everything is good, it should say listening on port 4000. Nothing is going to appear in the browser. There are ways we could. We could do a curl, right? But I don't want to do curls. I'll leave that to your Linux teacher to teach you guys curls, right? I freaking hate curls. OK. Do you have a lift, bro? All right, so jump over to Google Chrome. And to access that, you're going to type in localhost colon 4000 and hit enter. And you should see, welcome to our very plain site. You served some data, right? I'm going to help you in one second, Cynthia. For the rest of you that still have it working, if you do slash about or whatever you called your second route and hit enter, there you go. It's a cold, dark, rainy day in Pizzaville. So for those of you that do not have a working server, no worries. I will come around and help you. Anybody who has a working server, that's it. No lab. We'll do the lab next week, and I'll push it for another week uh, because we'll deploy this to Heroku at the beginning of next class. Okay? Cool. But the quiz is still on, right? Quiz is still on because the quiz covers all the refresher from last week and the little bit we did this morning. The quiz? Uh, tomorrow by midnight.